Hi, I'm Kevin. And I'm Amanda. And we are serving up all that jam. A lighthearted look at the weekend jam bands. Where we break down the jam scene's biggest stories, talk new bands, upcoming tours, and show reviews. A little laughing, some hot takes, and an always positive message for the community. Week of November 20th, 2023, Brian Haas. Welcome back to the 300th episode of All That Jam. Thanksgiving is in a few days and Christmas is not that far behind. It's a time for reflection and celebration and for some struggle. And if you are struggling, please reach out to someone because we love you. Now let's jump into the All That Jam weekly recap. This week, Brian Haas. We spoke with Brian for over two hours. So even with this fifth drop from that session, we have just scratched the surface. Um, We have two parts today. One is about Sean Layton and his impact on Jacob Fred Jazz Odyssey. And the second covers one of his current projects, Punkadelic. And then we dive into more Jacob Fred about the reissues and about Little Tay Rides again. And he tells a great story about uh, the frustrations with recording that one. And we also have the top three stories of the week in just a bit. How was your week, Amanda? Hey, Kevin. Um, My week was fantastic. And, you know, a big part of that was all of the fantastic people we got to talk to last week. We had six different interviews. I think that might be the most we've ever had, Kevin. In one week, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, just like thinking back about it, Vinny uh, from Mo, I think, kicked things off for us. Uh, and then Brownie was an awesome conversation, too. You and uh, Mark really got into some good stuff around, um, you know, the Disco Biscuits and and just what it's like being them. And I feel like Mark was very, very humble, but also really proud of where they're at. He feels like where they are right now is is the best that they've ever been. And that's amazing. Um, yeah, it's uh, and- such an easy interview. We asked him a question. He was like, all right, I'll talk for 15 minutes about that. It, made life, yeah. it makes life easy. Makes life easy. And also just, I think uh, it's clear that he's doing things in his world that make him happy, the DJ stuff. And, you know, there's something to be said for tackling new projects at different points in your life. So I really felt that joy from him. Um, One of my favorite conversations of the week was Jesse Miller um, of Lotus, of course, but then um, kind of that experimental jazz outfit, Octave Cat, who are phenomenal. Um, I thought he really did a good job of differentiating his work between the two bands. Um, Mm. And both, of course, are known for being um, extremely creative uh, in the music that they make. So I think that was um, that was the first part of the week. And we ended with another uh, triple set of interviews. We had um, Adam Chase uh, from Jazz is Fish. uh, And then, of course, he has his own music, Chess Club. um, And then um, with his brother, too. And I think, Kevin, you had a really nice connection to one of Adam's earlier bands when he was a young and yes black eyed susan they were local to virginia maryland you know the the del marva region we like to call it delaware maryland to virginia and uh yeah and i didn't put it together when you said yeah i got adam chase and i was like wait a minute i know that name and it all clicks so uh we told him uh we'd have him back on because i really want to pick his brain a little more about that band and what happened they were big they had they opened for some national acts and then gone. Yeah, there's a few bands from that time that I feel the same way about, and I've always wondered, you know, what happened. Um, so let's see. Rounding out the week, Chris Atkins. Um, he is a musician and songwriter based in New Orleans, and probably best known Kevin for being the guitarist for George Porter Jr.'s band. But he's worked with so many other people too. And then last but not least, of course, Ryan Jalbert from the Motet. This was a big one for me, Kevin. And I have to say, I was looking forward to this one um, because I've been a fan of the Motet basically since the beginning, since they kicked things off in the late 90s. But he also has a side project, Jalbatross, which plays out here in Denver quite a bit. And it's another one of those stories, I think, of um, musicians finding the creative space to do things that they really want to do. And so I think those conversations are always really interesting. Yeah. And we have four scheduled for this week. So we are finishing the year strong. Um, 
maybe slow down a little because Christmas time will be stockpiled so we can get through the craziness of Christmas and the holidays. I had a sneak peek at this week's top three and I'm kind of excited. So without further ado. The top three stories of the week. All right, Kevin. I think we have a nice uh, a nice variety of stories for this week. I want to start with um, your favorite pop star and mine, Taylor Swift. Now, this might not be the story that you think it's going to be. Um, some of you may have heard there have been just a series of different incidents um, at some of her shows um, overseas. But what I wanted to talk about is a little bit closer to home. Um, I found this article in the Philadelphia Inquirer um, that said, sorry, Swifties, no more songs from Taylor ahead of the Eagles Chiefs matchup. So um, radio silence on Q102. Um, This was announced on Good Day Philadelphia that Taylor songs will be on pause leading up to the Super Bowl rematch. And I just have never heard of anything like that. I don't know what to make of it. If anything else, it's maybe getting people talking about the station. Great promotion. Be- right. Better than better than trying to do a turkey drop, probably. I think so. I think so. Now, uh, Taylor Swift is a Reading, Pennsylvania native. She's an Eagles fan. Um, so I guess that's maybe part of the challenge here, um, because, of course, we know she's been spotted at Chiefs games. Um, but this playful band, so it is in good fun, um, began... Um, late afternoon on Friday, and it's going until um, this Tuesday. So, you know, if you're not a huge fan of her work, this might be a great time to listen to Q102. Yep. <laughs> All right. So that's our first story. Um, this next one could not be different. Could, this next story could not be more different. I came across an article about um, space music. So, um, NASA has some data that comes in from some of its telescopes, and there's a new collaboration that's enabling that data to be used as the basis for original music that, like, any of us could play. It's called a sonification project. I have not heard of this, but I think it started in about 2020. Had had you heard anything about this? No, I had not, but when you mentioned it, I went and found some on YouTube. Sounds like like a John Cage composition, and the the title of it is what well, uh, where parallel lines converge, mm-hmm. which sounds like the name of a jam band song. Oh, it really does. Actually, I almost wanted to Google to see if there was anything like that out there because that definitely, definitely sounds like it. Yeah. So you know, this new phase of the project is taking that data into slightly different territory. But you're right; they've been able to. Um, take this digital information and translate it into notes and sounds. I mean, pretty amazing stuff and a totally different way to think about astronomy too. Mm -hmm. Um, But now they're taking this information and working with a composer, um, developing versions of the data that, you know, other people could play. So um, they're looking at data from a small region at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, where a supermassive black hole resides. I mean, the whole thing to me is just amazing. I'm a big science fiction fan. So the fact that this is happening, I think is just super cool. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm excited to see where that goes. Um, Yeah. It was very, very strange. And the band was a bass saxophone and a violin and a viola, not a viola, the bigger one, but that's not a cello um a vibraphone and a drummer and grand piano very strange combination of instruments that they were playing this piece with so yeah i'm gonna be honest i would love to talk to the um the composer um but the conductor as well um charles eric lafontaine um this was recorded um what you heard was probably what was recorded this past summer at mcgill university that's what i've seen um but the sheet music is available uh, really for anyone that would want to see it. So we're going to have to share that. It would be super cool if some of the artists we knew maybe wanted to do something with Tried that. Tried it, yeah. Yeah, I would really love that. So we'll see. But um, to me, there's nothing better than when two seemingly kind of unconnected either genres or or fields come together. And so whoever thought to do this, uh, it's very, very creative. 
So that's our second story. And we're going to go from Taylor Swift to supermassive black holes and now to Andre 3000. So don't ask me to tell you what the thread is between all of those. But I started hearing about this story online probably late last week. And then all of a sudden it was just everywhere. Um, The new Andre 3000 album, all flute, no rap. And I think the big kind of buzz around this is that, as usual, people have a lot to say about that shift. And so I think the story is, yes, it's the music, but it's also this discourse about our expectations of musicians, you know, based on what we've already seen from them. And so, Kevin, I just wanted to kind of ask you a general question. When artists make huge pivots, I mean, this is definitely a pretty big pivot from what at least we all know him for. Um, I mean, should they expect to get a little heat for that? Or, you know, should they just be able to do the things that they feel they want to do? Um, well, that's interesting you should ask. Um, the, the short that we dropped today is with a guy, Anayat Hussein and Greg Hatza, and it's about this. Um, in as much as I asked him about how do you respect tradition while pushing boundaries. And um, it's tough. He says he gets flack from a lot of people because they're a traditionalist. You know, I guess half the pe- probably half the people in the world want things to stay the way they are and not change. And the other half is like, yeah, let's work and change some stuff up. So I follow and let's work and change some stuff up. Let's push the boundaries. Let's figure Mm -hmm. out the next thing. I'm with you. And I have to say, as I was reading about um, this album called New Blue Sun, this is um, his debut solo album. It is eight pretty lengthy instrumental tracks, all experimental music performed on a variety of flutes. My first thought was instrumental music. This comes up on our show all the time, Mm -hmm. just in terms of how even jam band fans sometimes react or maybe have a slightly different, you know, experience with music like that. And then I tried in my mind to go meta and think about the general listening public. And yeah, I guess I can see where people would just not know what to do with it. And maybe that's part of the reactions that we're seeing also. Right now, there is a band that he played with on this that was an established band, correct? So Kevin, this is a solo album, but um, there definitely are other musicians that are on this album, a percussionist, keyboardist, and a guitarist. Um, But, you know, Andre playing contrabass flute, Mayan flutes, I mean, it's pretty amazing. Um, In the lead up to the release of the release, he took part in a number of pretty rare interviews that kind of took maybe some of the intrigue out and explained a little bit more um, about what he was trying to do. There's a really great one with NPR's All Songs Considered, Um, And I'm not even going to necessarily try to get into all of it because it was a pretty, (laughs) a pretty lengthy and extensive article. But he does mention that some of this album was inspired by various psychedelics and other experiences he's had, um, you know, living through um, ayahuasca and other stuff like that. And, you know, basically, as he says, um, the things that happen in my life that's what I want to make music about, but I don't want to rap about it anymore. I'm 48 years old. And right. not to say that age is something that dictates what you rap about, but what am I going to rap about? A colonoscopy, my eyesight going bad. I mean, it was a really interesting and honest take, I think, on where he feels he is right now. It reminded me of something Grace Slick said, that nobody should be playing rock and roll when they're 50. Hmm. You know, I think sometimes to myself, maybe not in those exact words, but, you know, you see some of these Rolling Stones, you know, these bands that have just been there forever. Now, to some degree, that music is such a part of them that it is completely authentic. But there are times when I think to myself, is that really, you know, something that that I want to go and see, you know, people that are, you know, way past that part of their lives trying to still do the same thing. And I guess maybe that's what it is for me doing the same stuff all the time is to me, maybe feels like a waste of talent, but I'm definitely not one to to judge that. There seems to be a lot in rock and roll of you can't walk away. I'm going to die on stage. 
And, you know, some people walk away. Like, it hasn't Elton John retired now? Something yeah. that he did a last tour. And he, he'll <laughs> probably play again. But, you know, I, I just feel, I guess I feel like, I don't know, stop sucking up all the air in the room, Rolling Stones. Let somebody else, you know, get on. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think, um, and I think also, what's key to maybe this story, which is probably true for a lot of people is um, it's really clear that there's no issue, right? There's nothing that happened that took Andre 3000 away from rap specifically. There weren't any Except life and growing up. You know, he said, I love rap music. It was part of my youth. I'd love to be out there with everybody doing that. It's fun. He said, it's like being on the playground, but that's not happening for me. And this is the realest thing that's coming right now. So, I mean, he's not saying he would never do that, but that's not where he's at. And he wants to make the most of, as he says, whatever gifts are coming to him. And and I really respect that. I mean, that that can't be easy on certain levels to have to put forth when you're known for something completely different. He, he has enough clout with his name, too, though, that he can pull this out. If some guy just decided to release a flute album, ain't nobody be talking about it. It wouldn't even make the thousand threshold download for spotify <laughs> probably oh uh, you know what that's a good point and i think you are right and so you have to have people that maybe are willing to do that or, or just feel called to do that to hopefully make it a little bit easier you know quote unquote good for him. For others right good for him for working it too though for using it i mean he's got a shot why not maybe he's going to turn somebody on to music like this a more ambient erythral you know kind of thing meditative you know yeah i think so um now (laughs) when you look at at the um the album like let's say wherever you go to find your music it's out there um the song titles are probably as long as my dissertation title. And I think I had one of the longest dissertation titles NC State had ever seen. It was something like 45 words. So I would just say he's still in there, that personality, right? That we all kind of know or even grew up knowing of him. It is still there. Um, So he's not trying to take on a completely new persona. I think that's really hard to do. Stay true to yourself, but then also really go in a totally different direction. So some of it reminded me a little bit of like Sun Ra or something like that with, you know, some some Zappa moments in there, just stuff that you can't predict. You don't know what's going to happen next. And you really have to open up your mind that whatever you're going to be hearing is what it is. And you can't be guessing or have expectations about what's going to happen next. And these songs are long. They're jam band length, 12 minutes, 14 minutes. So we might be primed, Kevin, for something like this more than most people. Right, exactly, exactly. So thinking about that, um, Jacob Fred Jazz Odyssey does a lot of those same things. And we were so lucky to get to talk to Brian there. Um, you know, I had thought about doing both spots for Brian about Sean. Uh, the second part I held back getting into, uh, Sean taking his own life. And the reverberations that are felt to this day by Brian Reed and the music community at large. Um, we decided to go with something else. But let's listen to into Jacob Fred Jazz Odyssey early days with Sean Layton. Can I ask you about Sean and things like that? Well... Man, Sean is, that's such a huge conversation, you know? I mean, Sean is, Sean heard me playing classical music when I was 16 at the University of Tulsa. I was studying with a professor there, and I was getting ready to go do that international piano competition I was telling you guys about. And so Sean heard me in a practice room just going through all this extremely difficult material, and somebody kept knocking on the door, and I just thought somebody was making a mistake or something because I was 16. I was a little nervous about being at the university and I had the practice room reserved and somebody just kept knocking on the door. I was a little intimidated, but I eventually opened the door up and it was Sean Layton. And Sean just stands there. He's very stern. He just says, you should not be playing classical music. I heard you improvising in the style of Beethoven. I heard your technique. 
you should not be playing classical music. It's a waste of your time. And I'm like, uh, nice to meet you. My name's Brian. And he said, I'm Sean Layton. And then I knew who he was. He had won uh, the Perriott scholarship to go to the University of Tulsa. And it's a scholarship they would only offer like every 10 to 15 years. And the Perriott was very hard to get. And it meant that you had a total full ride plus all this extraneous grant money to buy CDs and to buy a computer and to compose. And it's like the most prestigious scholarship you could get at the University of Tulsa. So I knew who he was. I said, oh, you're Sean Layton. Boy, I'd like to get the Perriott. And he's like, you'll never win the Perriott playing other people's music. I won the Perriott because I'm a composer. I'm a real musician. I don't just play other people's music. I was like, well, I'm a composer too, bro. But, you know, I want to play classical music. I love this. He was like, waste of time. You're playing the music of old dead white men. He was very stern, very intense at our first meeting. And then I lost that competition, like I told you guys. And so that was a big wake, spiritual wake-up call for me. And I, I, you know, again, was back at the university. At that point, I'd already been offered a full scholarship. I never applied anywhere else except the University of Tulsa. They gave me a full scholarship, a full ride when I was 16. I did not win the Perriott. Sean was right. And Sean would kind of haunt he would, he like figured out when I was there and when I wasn't there. And he would sort of haunt me when I was trying to practice. And my scholarship is for classical music. So I felt like I had to keep doing it. But one time I was in the practice room and Sean shows up and he gave me bitches brew. He gave me that yellow Thelonious Monk record, genius of modern music, volume one. And he gave me a love Supreme. He gave me those three albums. I took them home to Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, where I still lived with my parents, and I put on all three of those records, and I hated all three of those records. I just remember sitting there thinking, like, this is trash. I hate jazz. This is rubbish. What are they doing? Like, what's happening here? What is going on? Why does this piano sound so clunky? What is happening? But those are the three records that Sean gave me. Coltrane, Love Supreme. Thelonious Monk, Genius of Modern Music, Volume 1, and then Bitches Brew. And I hated all three of those albums. But I kept listening to them. And Sean eventually said, you need to stop by my apartment. Like, you're driving here to University of Tulsa. You got a 40-minute drive back to your parents' house. You need to stop by my apartment one of these times, right? And so... I was still 16. I was intimidated by him. He was so gruff and grumpy and kind of intense. And he had me into his apartment and he said, you, you look hungry. I'm going to cook you some Indian food. And I was like, man, I'm going to get in trouble, you know, because there was, you know, no real way to contact my parents. I eventually used his home phone, called my home phone, told my parents what was going on. They thought it was weird. But I said, eh, it's a guy that won the Perriot. And they were like, oh, OK, maybe you should hang out with him. So as he's cooking me Indian food in his apartment, he puts on this uh, Ravi Shankar, this beautiful live Ravi Shankar record. And I remember, and he was like, so I can tell you didn't like the albums I gave you. I was like, oh, I still have them at home. He was like, he was like, your gateway to the kind of improvisation that you should be doing for a living, your gateway to that is understanding Ravi Shankar. It's a great mixture of a classical concept meets an improvisatory concept. Indian classical music, as you guys know, it's based on a raga. So you have to stick to the raga, and it's preferable that you keep playing those notes in that order. But then you're also improvising on top of the raga. So it was very intelligent. Sean knew the jazz was too much. So he started me with Indian classical music. And sitting there, eating Indian food, listening to Ravi Shankar, suddenly it all started to make sense. I was able to hear how influenced by Ravi Shankar, John Coltrane was. And it started to seep in bit by bit. And my obstinance and my blocks started to dissipate. But Sean Layton insisted. He insisted that I become a jazz 
Canis. He didn't let it slide, and he didn't make it optional at all. He just kept working on me, kept working on me, kept working on me. So then I start TU as a classical pianist at age 18. I did, you know, I was training for the Van Clyburn, for the 97 Van Clyburn at that time. So I did my junior recital first semester of my freshman year. I did my senior recital second semester of my freshman year. I was practicing piano eight to 12 hours a day and just completely burned out. Had like a had had like a had like a mental breakdown pretty much. I was amassing too much music all at once and Sean was right there and he was like, "See, I told you." And so that was right around the time that's a now I'm I finished my first year of TU. I've already done my junior recital and my senior recital. And then my little brother Richard, he knows I'm kind of having a meltdown. He's calling me, leaving me these messages on my voicemail in my dorm room and he's going hey remember that band i was telling you about that i sneaked out and i went and saw a couple years ago they're playing eclipse in tulsa so this is now in my sophomore year i'm already having these big questions about classical music and so i'm 19 the year is 1993 and my middle brother who's still at home with my parents he would always sneak out and go see music keeps calling me over and over and over again dude, you got to go see this band. You got to go see this band. And I'm like, bro, I don't care about punk rock bands. I grew up in the Tulsa punk rock scene. Punk rock's dead. He's like, no, this is different. They're called Billy Goat. And this guy, the leader of this band is insane. The leader of this band is so crazy. So Sean's already moved me towards all this jazz, towards all this stuff. And so I acquiesce. Richard, my little brother, just keeps calling me about this band. So the club is walking distance to the TU campus. So a group of us just walked down to the club. I walk in, 93, I'm 19 years old. Mike Dillon is buck-ass naked on stage playing timbales. The band is killing. The band is killing. They're playing this like, it's like Coltrane meets Bad Brains, right? It's like this punk jazz thing. Mike's up front, buck-ass naked. I'm right up front. His dick is right in my face, and he's taking this crazy timbali solo, and I realized everything I was trying to do with classical music was completely irrelevant. The club was oversold. Like, people were hanging off of the freaking walls. Uh, his Mike D's wife had her top off on stage. There were women in the audience who had their shirts off. Men had their shirts off. I'm a sophomore in college studying classical music, and I'm just like, Ah, and I had a total spiritual catharsis. Went back and I knew I would never play classical music ever again. And seeing Billy Goat, seeing Mike Dillon live changed my life forever. And also because Sean Layton had already prepped me with all of this beautiful black music, you know, America's music. And so I was just in the perfect place to receive what Billy Goat and Mike Dillon was offering that evening. And I started Jacob Fred Jazz Odyssey two weeks after seeing Mike Dillon play live. We, we couldn't find a bassist, but Sean Layton was the drummer. I brought in the other guys in the TU Jazz program, which seemed like they were having a ton of fun. And I really just started Jacob Fred Jazz Odyssey to learn how to play jazz. I started it to teach myself how to play jazz. I never thought it would take off or become an international ensemble that played North Sea Jazz Fest and Berlin Jazz Festival. I never, I only started it to learn how to play music, but I intelligently picked the best players at the University of Tulsa. And all of a sudden, Jacob Fred Jazz Odyssey just kind of took over the Midwest. Like, well, just, I couldn't even play. We were playing in front of 300 people a night. I was still just, I could barely play. And we were playing in front of 300 to 500 people every night, you know, then Mars Williams, you know, just like we just got lucky. Mars Williams from Liquid Soul, the saxophonist in the Psychedelic Furs. He just said that it was like 95. We just put out Lincoln Continental. He said he was getting paid at the Double Door in Chicago 
there was a stack of CDs on the talent buyer's desk. And the CD on top was Jacob Fred Jazz Odyssey. And Mars was like, hey, do you care if I take this home? And the talent buyer was like, you can take it. I'm never going to listen to it. And my number was in the CD jacket. All of a sudden, 1995, we're opening up for Liquid Soul at the double door in front of 600 people twice a month. I mean, all this stuff just sort of conspired in our favor. And here we are, you know, but Sean was, Sean was the person who primed me to be able to even receive Mike Dillon. I mean, yeah, I like punk rock. I grew up in the Tulsa punk rock scene, going to punk rock shows, getting my ass kicked by skinheads every you know, week. I was in the mosh pit every week, you know? I mean, I love punk rock, but what Mike Dillon was doing was this weird fusion between jazz and punk rock. And I literally started Jacob Fred Jazz Odyssey two weeks after hearing Mike Dillon. Kevin, I think we've mentioned this before um, in different ways, but this conversation with Brian truly stuck with me on so many levels. And Sean, being the first drummer for Jacob Fred Jazz Odyssey and really not even being in the band that long. The impression that he made, um, not only on his band members, but so many of us is clear um, even to this day. So that was, um, I think, a really special thing that we could really dig into that a little bit. Now, I um, want to just remind everyone before we get back into um, this interview with Brian that we are on social media at All That Jam Pod. Um, or online at allthatjampod.com. And if you search for us or go wherever you find your podcast, you will find all 300 plus now. Kevin, are we? Are we it, it'll be 300 with this one, yes. There we go. Um, okay, so milestone moment there. Come um, back tomorrow for 301. There you go. <laughs> I know, I'm always trying to rush things. Um, but yes, anywhere you get your podcast, please um, give us a like, subscribe. Don't forget about YouTube either. Um, there are some fantastic interviews um, that are, are whole and, and really great to put on if you are curious about more of the full conversation itself. Um, and so want to just make sure everyone knows where we are. Um, Kevin, why don't you tell us a little bit about what's coming up this week? All right. Yeah. Tomorrow we have Magic Beans about their year Halloween fall tour. Uh, Wednesday, Adam Deitch on Russell Batiste. Um, he, uh, I just asked, Russell had just passed. And I said, did you, were you friends with Russell? And we got into a really good conversation about it, which verged, you know, diverged from what we were originally doing on um, Thursday. We got DJ Brownie, the, the origin story coming up Friday. We have another origin story with octave cat and Jesse Miller, um, Saturday, Frankie and the witch fingers live versus studio. And then Sunday, uh, something I really, it took us a long time to get the interview with Maggie Rose. And then when we got in there, they were like, oh, we've been working with Don Hart. So that's definitely the clip we had to go with with that. Kevin, thank you. And I was just sitting there listening to you going through all of that. That's just one week. I mean, we're really, I think, in a, a great place. There's so much content coming out and I'm really so happy about that. Um, but let's get back into the interview um, here with Brian, because there's really a lot more. Um, we're going to get back in and we're going to hear Brian talk about his work with Mike Dillon and Nikki Glasby and Punkadelic. Um, they toured with La Special a year or so ago. Um, they definitely get out there, I've seen a couple tour dates from them, um, as well as some reissues of Jacob Fred, Jazz Odyssey material, um, and some other great things. So why don't we um, hear the rest of that interview now? So the album and the writing the songs, can you want to talk a little bit about the process of Punkadelic once you did decide to get together and do an album? Well, Mikey always says to me, Haas, nobody likes jazz, bro. Stop writing jazz songs. And so that's like the songs on the Punkadelic record are me responding to Mikey. Mikey's always like, what? Why do you hate Queens of the Stone Age, bro? Like, come on. Like, what's wrong with you? Hey, Hoth. Hey, Hoth. What's wrong with Queens of the Stone Age? Hey, Hoth. What's wrong? What? You think everything has to be dad? And so Mike was always just encouraging me to simplify my writing. Hey, Hoth. Come on. Nobody likes dad. And so, and so Punkadelic comes out of like me and Mikey butting heads. 
about my compositional style. And him, you know, he's like the angry Texas football player, you know, who just like wants me to simplify my stuff. And yeah, that punk rock ethic. Yeah. And he, and, and, and he always, you know, he, he loves the jazzier stuff I write for Nola Tet. But with that Punkadelic album, he just challenged me to get outside of my comfort zone. Like slowly but surely, the third song on that record, Mike made me listen to a ton of Queens of the Stone Age in the van until I was just like, oh, my God, I hate this band. And and he made me listen to it like all the different albums. No hot. You don't understand. Like this. This is brilliant. No hot. Like all this Mike D shit. And then after we listened to Queens of the Stone Age for like five hours, he's like, okay, okay, Hoth, write a thong. Okay, Hoth, now write a thong. I'm like, okay, here's the song. And so I wrote that track three slowly but surely, like after he made me listen to Queens of the Stone Age over and over again. And yeah, it's just, you know, he's my big brother. Like his job is to challenge me and to keep me on my toes and to keep me from repeating myself. And and uh, he keeps me on my toes every night. I mean, you know, he practices constantly. You know, James Singleton, I'm at James's house. He practices constantly. Johnny V practices. Like, all the people that I l- look up to, they think of this as a very blue-collar thing. I mean, you can call it art, but if you want to get better at it, you just got to keep doing it every day. So that's what, like, that's where Punkadelic comes from. Nikki wanted to keep playing. I wanted to keep playing. Mikey wanted to keep playing. And so we just kept playing, you know, and we caught a lot of guff for it. I got a lot of weird messages from a lot of people that I don't talk to anymore because if you're going to tell me it's okay that you go do your job, but I'm not allowed to do my job, that to me is a make it or break it in our friendship. I'm sorry. Like, you know, like some of my biggest detractors, people who work for the government, people who their, their jobs were never threatened. They worked the whole time through. And they're going, oh, no, you have to stop working. I said, well, when are you going to stop working? Oh, I don't have to stop working. What I do, I can work from home. And it's like, well, good for you. And so that's really what brought Mikey and Nikki and I together in a really clear way, was just the belief that all work is essential work. Fair enough. Fair enough. There we go. So what is- and, and, and that became very politicized. Right. But it just became politicized by guess who? Politicians. Right, sure. That, that's what politicians do. They politicize everything. But it's not political. Right. It's just we should be allowed to work. If I don't get to play music, I'm going to go crazy. And nobody wants that. Right. Do, do you have a few minutes to talk about some reissues on Royal Potato of the Jacob Fred stuff? Sure. Yeah. I'll talk about whatever you guys want. Yeah. Do you, do you, what, do you just want to go into to which albums were you know, released and, uh, and how that came about. Have they been remastered? What's the deal with it? So Reed's about to remaster. Reed's going to do a whole other series because he's so meticulous and just such a great historian. Reed is about to remaster Lincoln Continental, uh, live in Tokyo. I think they're already remastered and Royal Potato is about to put out this other series that's just called, Reed Mathis's remasters. I mean, I wish we could find a good pun because Reed, Reed Mathis and remasters is so close. The Reed masters, Reed masters. There you go. It's done. Yeah. You got to tell Calibro. That's what they're called. Reed, right, Ma- Reed masters. You just nailed it. So easy. I haven't, I've not had any food today, so I'm like a little slow, but, um, so we got the Reed masters coming out, which are going to be killing, but, there was some kind of weird dispute between maybe Ryko Disc and Hyena. Remember when Calibro and Joel Dorn and Bill Dern did Hyena Records, which was more of a jazz label? Mm-hmm. There was some kind of dispute, and so all that stuff got taken down off of all streaming platforms. Mm-hmm. And Calibro is wonderful. We got a hold of all the old discs, and Calibro put up those six right. just because that's what we had access to. All, mm-hmm. all those had been pulled down previously uh without our permission okay. uh, without anybody notifying us without anybody saying anything i just remember one day i looked at spotify and was like oh there's 10 albums gone 
So out of those 10, because Jacob Fred right now has 27 official releases under the band name. Um, and so we were able to get a hold of six of them and we put them back up and then we're going to do some remasters in the future. Right. So, so what was up with Reed and Winterwood? So Winterwood was an, ex- that was like an experiment, like right when people were putting widgets on their websites for the very first time, right when Winterwood came out, it just got put up on Jacob Fred's website as a download. And I think it got downloaded a huge amount of times, like 20,000 times, maybe something like that. And then when the widget expired, it just expired. So a lot of people still have it downloaded, but it was never put out on vinyl or CD. And um, I mean, it's Reed's, it's Reed's favorite album from that time period. I don't, for me, it's not my favorite. My favorite is Lil Tay Rides Again. Okay. Okay. <laughs> But that's why Reed and I work great together because we're not right. now, now we're little not, we're, we're not we're robots. Reed and I have very different ideas about what sounds good and what sounds terrible. And, and, and Reed and I find a nice compromise. Like I love Winterwood, but for me, it's a little, it's like a little overproduced, which I actually think is really cool. I mean, Reed put in so much time and energy to overproduce it. But I just prefer the more stripped down sound. But do I think it's one of the best things that we ever did as a band? Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the, the little Tay, and I don't know if I've got this right. I thought I heard Reed something say it was the first time you went on stage and had a set list, a set set list that you did night after night. Mm-hmm. So we were working with this producer on Lil Tay Rides Again, and the idea was going to be that we toured with him. We brought him in, in, in 2000. Yeah. When was this? Because because when did Reed when did Reed and I really stop playing together? God, this laptop is super old. Because this is the laptop that I bought for Lil Tay Rides Again, and the guy refused to use it, and instead used uh, like a PC. And the very first time we ever tried to do it live, where we were running everything through Ableton Live, and it was a sold out show in Tulsa. The PC crumbled on stage. We had no lines run. We just played acoustic to like 700 people. And we fired the guy immediately thereafter because he refused to use a brand new computer because we're all good friends with Sound Tribe. And they use Ableton. And all the guys in Sound Tribe said the same thing. Like, look, if you're going to use Ableton Live, you just have to buy a brand new MacBook Pro. So we spent band money, bought a new MacBook Pro. We did exactly what Jeffrey Lerner and everybody told us to do what Zach and Hunter and everybody and Phipps told us to do. We, you know, we did we did it exactly like Soundtribe told us, except our guy refused to use this beautiful MacBook Pro that I'm still using. And instead, he decided to use like this old PC. The guys in Soundtribe were very specific. They said, whatever you do, don't use a PC. Well, what did our guy do? He uses a PC and it was a disaster. So we fired that guy and instead just hired another guitarist. I did all the bass in my left hand and Reed and the other guitarist, we would recreate it every night. That, that record won an American Music Award for Best New Age Album, which, I mean, I thought was amazing. But when you go back and listen to it, it sure doesn't sound like any normal New Age Music. Jethro Tull won a Grammy for best heavy metal album. So. I, love it. <laughs> I mean, I just loved that the American Music Awards like acknowledged us. Like oh, we didn't fantastic. even think that, that was on our radar, but it won best new age album. And it's that's one of my favorite things that we ever did because it was all done in post. It was all us playing. The guy who refused to use the MacBook Pro and would only use a PC. Every time we get close to finishing the record, he would delete it because he didn't want the process to ever end. And so I was going absolutely crazy, crazy. This guy was addicted to Adderall and LSD. And, you know, he and I still don't talk to this day because I'm, I'm, I'm already crazy enough. I don't need any more crazy in my life. You know, like my own mental health is a constant struggle um, in all the best ways. But, but this guy just went off the deep end making Lil Tay rides again like I said, his addiction was LSD and Adderall. He deleted it three different times. 
And I knew very well he had the backup on a hard drive. And I'd say, well, where's the backup? Where's the hard drive? He'd just say, well, I don't know. I guess we just have to keep working on it. And so he made this thing go on and on forever. I told him if he deleted it again, I would kill him with my bare hands. I said, you do, you delete it one more time. I'm going to choke you to death. I was so mad. And so he eventually let it go through. Calibro was a total saint. We missed four deadlines with that album. And Calibro still let it come out. And as far as stuff done in post, Reed's favorite is Winterwood. My favorite is Little Tay Rides Again. All right. Uh, so, Kevin, just thinking about where we are in the year, um, you know, we are right um, kind of at the beginning of, of the big, big push for the holidays. And as we've mentioned, um, and actually done before, too, um, been spending a little bit of time talking with small business owners, music fans, a lot of fish fans who have such a wide ranging um, kind of variety of small businesses, everything from guided tours of New York City to children's illustrations. I mean, really so many amazing and creative things going on. And so we're going to create a special episode later this week um, where you're going to get to hear directly from those music fans, small business owners about what they do. Um, I'll also be putting out some additional information so we can make it really easy to find them. Um, and, you know, hopefully that will help them. As, as one person said to me last week, if, if you could help us find even, you know, a handful of new customers who didn't know about us before, that would be the best holiday gift in the world. So um, it's been really great, Kevin, to have those, you know, discussions and learn a lot about what people do. Um, so I would look for that at the end of this week. All right. I can't wait. Can't wait. We did that last year. It ended up in the episode. This year, we're putting it separate. And we'll have all the links so you can just go in there, grab what you need. Everybody, have a great Thanksgiving. Uh, I hope that it's everything that you imagine it to be. You get to eat lots of stuff. And like we said at the top, if if you're feeling alone, you feel, you know, you need someone, reach out. There are people out there. You know, even if there are people online, there are people out there who are going to, uh, look out for you and remember stay beautiful but don't stay underground too long i'll see you soon amanda all right kevin happy thanksgiving